Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. If you care about global development, you've probably already heard of J-PAL. They've been pioneers in the movement to conduct experiments to figure out what actually helps people in poverty. And you can read all about that in their excellent book, Poor Economics. Claire Walsh leads their work to increase the use of evidence in policymaking around the world, and managed to be given that quite senior role at the age of just 29. I wanted to learn more about her work and how she managed to advance so quickly in her career, so we scheduled this interview at EA Global San Francisco. As always, there's a blog post with a full transcript, summary, and links to articles discussed in the show. And now I bring you Claire Walsh. Today, I'm at EA Global San Francisco speaking with Claire Walsh. Claire is a senior policy manager at the MIT Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, more popularly known as JPAL. Claire manages JPAL's government partnership initiative, environment and energy sector, and oversees JPAL's policy publications. Claire has an MA from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she specialized in development economics and international business relations. Prior to joining j in 2012, she worked for nonprofit organizations in East Africa, working to improve the quality of education and employment opportunities for youth in the region. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Claire. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. We'll get to lots of concrete career advice later in the episode. But first off, what is j Government Partnership Initiative? So the Government Partnership Initiative is a multi-million dollar fund that supports three things. One, policy-relevant randomized control trials in partnership with government. Governments. So governments who have an important policy problem that they want to try to test a solution to uh, will apply in partnership with our researchers and our offices for funds to do that research. So say they have a cash transfer program and the cash transfers aren't actually reaching the poor people they're intended to and they want to test a solution and they need researchers that want to help them uh, work on this problem. So that's the first thing we fund. The second thing we fund is that there are a lot of completed randomized control trials out there about the different types of interventions that are effective in reducing poverty in a particular context. And sometimes those RCTs haven't been used. So we provide governments with technical assistance, either mostly human resources, to help them uh, build uh, political will and technical knowledge to be able to scale it up. The third thing we fund is a has a much broader goal of trying to help governments make evidence-informed decision-making the norm rather than the exception. So it funds governments who want to set up evaluation labs or innovation funds or nudge units uh, that have the mandate of systematically testing new programs before rolling them out. And to date, we've funded uh, 21 partnerships in 12 countries around the world and in lots of different regions across Southeast Asia, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. So maybe let's maybe let's take these in turn. Uh, the first one: What kinds of research projects are you involved with or funding? So GPI is completely sector agnostic and region agnostic. What we're really targeting is governments who want to use evidence and decision uh, and a program that's meant to do social good. So it could be, uh, for instance, a program to reduce crime in Bogota in partnership with the. Uh, security office and the mayor's office. It could be uh, RCT in partnership with the Industrial Training Council in Egypt that's trying to look at the impact of government job fairs. Um, but the thing that unites them is that the governments are committed up front to using the results from the study to inform a particular policy decision, uh, which is really important to us. And the, the second class of activities is kind of policy advocacy, is that right, for, for policies that you think are evidence-based? So it's not necessarily advocacy. It's a government who wants to, who is aware of a particular randomized control trial and an intervention that has been shown to work mm-hmm. and wants to... Uh, either pilot in their context and scale it up or uh, just just scale it up. And the third class of activities is kind of trying to change the, the culture in governments around the world so that they're more empirical, more, more evidence-based. How do you go about doing that? So luckily, there's a growing movement among governments that it actually lies outside of effective altruism. It just happens to be going on simultaneously where governments are more and more interested in things like big data and data science um, and using evidence from RCTs to inform policy decisions. Decisions. And often the way they do that is by creating new institutions within government that have the mandate and the requirement to use evidence. Um, so take the example of uh, Minedu Lab, which is a uh, innovation lab within the Ministry of Education in Peru that uh, does 
low-cost randomized control trials using administrative data to test uh, interventions that are supposed to improve uh, in education quality in the country. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of different, you know, policy ideas that I'm sure you're aware of and that your, your division might, you know, work on testing or on helping people to scale up. Are there any particular ones that stand out as having a particularly large impact on, on human welfare relative to the cost? Yeah, so it's probably good at this point to mention that all the views I express on this podcast are my own and not JPALs. Yeah, so I think, you know, it won't be surprising to hear that a lot of the GiveWell recommended top charities and the causes that GiveWell recommends are also the causes that we think are most cost effective. Um, so obviously, uh, unconditional cash transfers, uh, things that help uh, people take up uh, health services that are proven to have an impact and save lives like vaccinations. Um, so we're really excited about things like incentives for immunizations. Um, and we're also really excited about a lot of education interventions. Um, in developing countries, there's this huge problem of kids in school not actually learning to the level of their grade. And uh, a lot of randomized control trials have shown that uh, an approach that was pioneered by this Indian NGO called Pratam, uh, the teaching at the right level approach, which is really basic remedial education targeted at the level of the child rather than at the level of curriculum, can drastically improve um, basic numeracy, literacy, math skills. Um, and so that's something we're excited about in education. Mm. JPAL has a, a really attractive and clear website where it tries to lay out your findings in a way that people can easily digest and actually apply. Oh, thanks. <laughs> is it fair to say that quite a lot of your work is perhaps more on the communication side than, than on research? So for me in particular, yes, a lot of what I do is communication. I am distilling these 60-page papers from Econometrica into one-page uh, descriptions of their key takeaways for policymakers. Interesting. Uh, we might put up a few links to some of the most interesting pages on the site that, that people can, can go and take a look at. For example, I think you have a great page where you describe a whole lot of different interventions to try to make education better in, in the developing world, and you and you rate them based on you know how strong is the evidence that it works at all, and how large is the impact, and how much does it cost per student. Um, so people can take a look at that. Are there any other things that you think it would be particularly interesting for people into uh, policy reform to, to check out? Yeah, so two things. Well, hmm, three things. The first is one of the goals of our website is to be an evaluation clearinghouse for randomized control trials uh, done by our entire network of over 140 professors. So if you go to povertyactionlab.org slash evaluations, you can search our library of over 800 studies, and all of them have short two-page summaries, and you can filter it by country, by sector. You can also filter it by which ones have publicly available data so that you can go do your own analysis with the data if you're a data wonk. Uh, and okay, so that's the first one. Uh, second one is our uh, policy lessons page. So if you go to povertyactionlab.org slash policy hyphen lessons, um, that's a list of some of the areas where we think there's the strongest evidence. Um, that particular interventions are effective. So that's great for um, some of the main takeaways from this big body of research. The third thing we have and recently launched is called Research Resources. And this is for anyone who is an aspiring researcher themselves, like state a code for particular uh aspects of running randomized control trials, uh, guides on how to write survey questions well, um, how to code in different programming languages, and free and available to the public to download. What are some of the challenges that you face working with governments in the developing world, either to set up trials or you know, encouraging them to scale up things that have been demonstrated to work? So I think a lot of people's assumptions about what it's like to work with governments are true, not unfounded. Uh, in general, uh, evidence is not the top factor that policymakers consider when making decisions. It might be eighth or ninth on the list. And uh, what I've come to learn over time is that you know, there's often good reason for that. They have to work on the issues that their constituents care about, and uh, it may not always be uh, the policy that's backed by evidence that's a priority for their constituents at that time. Uh, it does tend to be slower working with bureaucracies. Uh, governments have a lot of restrictions in uh, how they can hire researchers or work with researchers or partner with outside organizations, so it can take longer uh, to develop partnerships. But I think we've overall been really surprised that there are um, particular ministries or champions within ministries or mayors who are really excited about using data and evidence um, 
that are eager to partner with NGOs or researchers in order to get things done more effectively. It sounds like you have a really a very senior role in JPAL, but you're only 29, right? <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> is it fair to say that your career has gone uh, pretty quickly, maybe, maybe more quickly than you thought, or is this just typical? Definitely more quickly than I thought. Yeah. How do you think you, you advanced up the ladder so fast? So I'm not sure I have the exact answer to your question, but in my experience, looking at my peers who are involved in similar international uh, development policy work, I think we owe a lot to our master's degree programs. There are a lot of um, public policy schools that tend to launch people into um, rapidly rising careers in government and international policy and research organizations. Uh, they're called the APSIA schools. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll stick up a, stick up a link to those. Yeah. Um, it's something we've found in general that uh, across the whole policy sector that people can really end up in positions of serious responsibility late in their twenties or early in their thirties. And yep. people just have to be a little bit opportunistic and hope to be in the right place at the right time, but they can end up, uh, you know, really jumping up a couple of rungs, uh, if, if, if they're lucky enough to, to get that situation. Yes. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Could the work you're doing unintentionally cause harm, perhaps? Is, is there anything that keeps you keeps you up at night? Oh, I don't think that there's a huge risk that we're doing harm, but I could think of a couple different potential pathways. Um, it could be the case that we're evaluating a program that ends up being ineffective or has an unintended impact, an unintended negative effect. But in a sense, that's why we're doing the evaluation, so we can hopefully catch that at a pilot stage. And, and if it's found to not work, you know, make a recommendation based on the evidence that the government shouldn't scale it up. And I guess there's some risk that by, you know, partnering with governments on research, we're taking away time and personnel resources that could be spent on uh, implementing programs or, you know, using monitoring data to improve programs. Um, but I think that there's so much low hanging fruit in terms of how government services are implemented that the likelihood of doing massive good is much bigger than the small probability of doing harm. Fair enough. Let's change track now to talking about uh, JPAL as a whole. Uh, what other work does, does JPAL do? So JPAL does three main things, research, capacity building, and policy work. In the research uh, vertical, we have uh, hundreds of research managers and research associates based in countries all around the world working with JPAL affiliated professors who are all faculty at universities to run randomized control trials of anti-poverty programs in the field. And this is always in partnership with an actual organization like an NGO, a government, or a company, etc. So they're actually producing the high-quality research. Second thing we do is policy. So this is about 100 staff around the world, and we have um, seven offices in total. We're responsible for making sure the research gets used. So in every sector where we work, agriculture, education, environment, energy, governance, health, etc., we synthesize the results from the larger body of RCTs that are already completed, and distill it into concrete policy lessons for decision makers. And we also, in addition to that more broadcasting approach, work directly with particular governments to help them scale up uh, or, or NGOs or foundations to help them scale up something that they're interested in scaling up after seeing an RCT found it to be effective. The last thing we do is capacity building. And this is really important because we're just one small organization and the number of organizations doing impact evaluations and the number of uh, governments and private companies doing impact evaluations is much larger. And we want to help grow it so that, you know, this tool can be used to help, um, decision makers all around the world, regardless of whether they get to work with IPA or JPAL or SIGA, et cetera. Um, and so we offer uh, training courses, both in person and online, to help uh, anyone who's interested learn how to do, um, learn some skills and impact evaluation themselves. Does JPAL have a good sense of what kind of social impacts it, it's having and whether it's, you know, delivering kind of bang for buck for the people who fund, fund JPAL itself? Yeah, that's a great question. So we like to track since we started in 2003, how many people have been reached by programs that were originally evaluated by JPAL affiliated professors and then scaled up by one of our partners, either an NGO, a government, et cetera. Um, and since 2003, um, over 300 million people around the world have been reached as a result of these scale ups. And we'd like to think that that is a pretty good indicator that this research can change people's lives. Uh, yeah. Do you know what those uh, programs are? Is there is there any one of them that's you know really taken off in a big way? 
Oh, of course. Um, deworming, uh, anti-malarial bed nets, free distribution of anti-malarial bed nets, um, uh, some reforms in Indonesia related to um, ID cards for national social protection programs, uh, chlorine dispensers for safe water, etc. So in the past, you were working in nonprofits. Maybe can, can you give us a kind of description of the path you've taken in your career to end up where you are now? Sure. So in college, I was actually an anthropology major. <laughs> And I had studied abroad in Uganda and knew that I wanted to continue to work in East Africa. And so I started working uh, part-time for two small NGOs that have now since grown a lot bigger, um, Educate and Africade, uh, working on uh, employment opportunities for youth who face a labor market that's just dismal in Uganda and Tanzania, where they graduate high school with all these great credentials and then find that they're faced with a lot of really sorry job options. And so trying to find ways that they can um, start their own businesses or become entrepreneurs um, and I was excited to work for them uh, uh, for about a year and quickly realized that I didn't have enough skills to really make it in the international development sector. And so that's why I went back to grad school so quickly just after a year of work. What kinds of skills were you lacking? Uh, so, oh gosh. Um, Too many to name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many to name, but I'll never criticize my liberal arts education. I, I owe everything to it. So I, I don't knock that either, but I didn't have, um, one management skills, um, accounting, uh, basic business, basic finance, how to fundraise. Uh, and then on the more technical side, um, I was supposed to be working on monitoring and evaluation, but I had no idea about statistics, econometrics, impact evaluation methods. Uh, and so I made it a priority to get those skills in grad school. And then what did you do after that? I immediately upon finishing grad school, I applied to j Pals Policy Wing. Okay. Wow. And <laughs> right. <laughs> you got a helicopter in to yeah, do some really important work. Um, the, the two charities that you worked for earlier, do, do you think they were high impact? It's so interesting. I'm so impressed um, in particular by Educate because they've taken their monitoring and evaluation extremely seriously. They have, um, have I think, three ongoing RCTs of their model, and they've already been able to scale up to hundreds of thousands of kids in Uganda and have uh, are piloting making their curriculum part of the national curriculum in Rwanda and all the while um, doing uh, high quality evaluations to inform their model going forward. So mm. I've been really excited to see what they've done since I've left and none of it's due to me, but it's, yeah, they're a really great organization. Check them out. Excellent. Oh, we'll stick up a link. So if you were going to move on with your career uh, after, after leaving J-PAL, uh, where, where else could you go to where you might have, you know, an, an even larger impact or just be able to, to advance your skills to the next level? I would love to work in institutions within government agencies is probably within an, you know, an implementing agency in the executive branch that's tasked with doing research about how to make government programs more effective and programs that reach the poor. So organizations that I know that do this are the Off Office of Evaluation Services in the General Services Administration, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I know that countries around the world, these are popping up more and more frequently. I know that DC, Washington DC has just opened a, a lab like this and they're popping up everywhere. And I think why that could potentially be higher impact is that I could be doing research that would potentially affect an actual spending decision. Perhaps the place that's most similar to JPAL is the Center for Effective Global Action. And I spoke with, with your friend uh, Ophir Reich uh, yeah. just, just earlier this weekend about uh, that. It's, it's a group at UC Berkeley. Yes. How do you feel JPAL and, uh, and SIGA compare? We're close partners and okay. very much part of the same family. It's, it's all very friendly. You're not, yeah. you're, not, you're not competing for funding too hard. No. <laughs> well, and they do really cool things that we don't. Um, in particular, they have this great program where they bring developing country researchers to Berkeley uh, for a semester to learn how to do impact evaluation and public policy research and then take that back to their countries. That's huge for building capacity among developing country researchers. They also do a lot more related to um, innovative measurement like satellites and sensor networks and data science and data visualization. Um, so we, we do complementary things. That's good. Uh, do you know of any uh, you know, particularly promising job opportunities that JPAL has available at the moment? Yeah, uh, people should check at year-round povertyactionlab.org slash careers. We usually have between 80 and 100 positions available um, on research projects, but also in our uh, headquarters and regional offices. And we don't just post the jobs at JPAL, but all the other similar uh 
organizations as well. So IPA, uh, Innovations for Poverty Action, for those who don't know, uh, SEGA, um, Evidence for Policy Design at Harvard, um, and many other similar organizations as well. And we recruit on an annual cycle. Applications are usually due in December, and uh, we make a hiring push in the first quarter of every year. But then we also have jobs that are up year round that people can apply to on a rolling basis. What are the differences you found between working in academia versus the nonprofit sector? And do, do you feel like you're a much better fit for, for one than the other? So in academia, there's much more room for skepticism. Uh, and I think that I am potentially more suited to that. Um, in nonprofits, I think it was really exciting to be working directly with people, providing uh, people directly with services. And I miss that a lot. Um, and But I enjoy that within academia, there's, there's more room for questioning whether what we think is helping people is or isn't. Mm. So is the challenge there that if internally you're not so optimistic about the, the value of the intervention that you're delivering, it could be demoralizing for staff? Or is it that it would uh, discourage donors from supporting you and helping you to scale up the program? I actually think that a lot of NGOs are very uh, introspective and reflective and are always seeking to question their assumptions and improve their model. It's more just me personally that I have a really hard time uh, working on something if I don't know it has an impact. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of which, um, one irony that people sometimes point out about doing lots of randomized controlled trials of interventions or, you know, policy changes is that randomized controlled trials as an approach haven't themselves been tested through a randomized controlled trial. Yeah. So you could imagine doing this, but it would be incredibly expensive where you took some policy areas and you did lots of RCTs and then you came back to see whether the ones where you'd done the RCTs were better than, than another randomly chosen bunch of policy areas where, where you didn't. Given, given that we haven't yet done that and it might be just too impractical to do, uh, how strong do you think is the empirical evidence behind uh, empiricism in development? That's a really great question. Uh, so it's true that we probably won't ever get that lab coat approach yeah. where we evaluate some things with RCTs and other things not. But I think a couple of our affiliated professors are working on the question of whether um, evidence is a powerful tool in changing policy decisions. So randomly assigning uh, certain public officials to get access to evidence about an intervention that works um, and others not and seeing whether that changes what decisions they make. Mm. Um, so those are there are a couple of experiments ongoing, mm. and I think those will be exciting to um, see the results of to see whether evidence is actually something that can change uh, policymakers' minds. Yeah, that's a, that's a very cool experiment. Do, do you have a sense anecdotally whether it's the case that in general RCT you know, move funding most of the time or at least some of the time? Uh, so I can't make a statement about the entire sector as a whole. I can only see what I've observed. And what I've observed is that particularly for NGOs, when, they're, when they've completed an RCT and it's shown that their program is effective, it can completely change their trajectory in terms of fundraising. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen a lot of governments be persuaded not just by you know, data from RCTs, but also survey data that shows whether people like a policy or not, which is often collected during the course of an RCT, but is very useful information for them for making a decision. So RCTs are, have a nice feature in that they don't just report you one impact number. The surveys are ask about a number of things and can actually provide you stats about what your constituents said about this new policy, whether they like it uh, better than the old system. And that can be just as persuasive and important as the whether it had a positive impact. Hmm. So j uh, RCTs would be pretty reliable, but are you aware of kind of sham RCTs that nonprofits or kind of governments run just to, to support? No. Not, not, not fake uh, trials, but, you know, trials that aren't run uh, with, to a very high standard and that are, that are mostly designed just to support whatever policy they wanted to endorse anyway. So the way I think about approaching that question is really case by case, and I don't know how else to do it, but there are a set of criteria that you would look at to determine whether um, an individual RCT is of good quality or not, um, such as whether uh, they do balance tests to determine that the treatment and control groups are uh, statistically equivalent on average for the major factors um, that might be important to the intervention working or not. You might want to check if there were problems related to attrition or spillovers that might be confounding their analysis and applying these principles and going to the ground truth and just looking at the papers themselves is the only way that I've been able to tell good RCTs from bad RCTs. And I wouldn't, I, 
I don't think I can generalize that there's an organization out there who's doing bad ones. I will say that policy-based evidence-making is yeah. prolific. That's, the, that, that's kind <laughs> of what I was uh, thinking about. You know, I'd, I've, I've worked in government and when we were trying to evaluate, you know, impact evaluations that we'd receive, I think that you could sense that a lot of them that you would read, uh, they weren't designed with complete even-handedness in mind. They were designed with a slant towards supporting the policy that the government supported and that um, the, the pre-existing status quo. That happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so policy reform careers are, are one of the paths that we recommend that basically everyone thinks about uh, pursuing. But there, there's some people who are skeptical out there and they, they say, how can you ever really tell that you've made a difference in a specific case? Uh, and perhaps they have a preconception that it would be quite rare for someone like you or I to actually be able to influence government policy because there's so many other factors that, that are going into these decisions. And as you were saying, like evidence might be the eighth or ninth thing on, on the list. Is, is there anything that you could say to try to convince someone who's a skeptic about working in think tanks or evidence, uh, you know, evidence collection, or perhaps even going into elected office themselves? So what I didn't understand before I started doing work with governments is how small the circle of people who control the purse strings is uh, within, you know, a specific agency. And there is a lot of room uh, if you can influence that person's decision about what programs to move forward with and what programs to not move forward with. Um, in that way, I think it's possible to have um, a large degree of impact. I think for the people who are skeptical of working in government themselves, they can always consider working for organizations uh, that are advocating for specific policy changes that are backed up by evidence. I think in, in some the kinds of people that I'm thinking of, they, they might believe that, you know, an individual politician can, can change spending outcomes. So if you could actually become a minister in a particular area, then as you're saying, you just have a lot of discretion. But maybe the, the longer the chain of causation, so the further back you're working, if, if you're just collecting evidence that at some point might be used to, by someone else to advocate to a government to try to convince someone to change the, the spending, uh, the longer the chain, the more concerned they become that we might be kidding ourselves about whether what we're doing is ever actually going to, to make a difference. Are, are you mostly, just confident that it, that it works based on personal experience where you can see cases where, uh, you know, funding decisions have changed and it's just very hard to see how that would have happened without, you know, some research being done or the right conversations being had at a particular time. So a couple different responses. One, this worry that evidence is generated and not used is very real. And we try to design GPI, the main thing I work on, a uh, government partnership initiative in order to account for that. So it prioritizes governments who've upfront committed to using the evidence in a particular policy decision to try to prevent lack of use from coming into play. And I think at JPAL, we think about evidence use going much beyond the original implementing partner on a study. And that's why we're committed to making all the papers publicly available on the website, putting the data up on the website, putting really short, non-technical summaries up on the website, because we think these insights are not just useful for the people who were part of the original evaluation, but they might help us uncover some underlying things about human behavior that are useful for designing better programs anywhere, like how people respond to incentives or how to get people to take up services or how to more effectively deliver services. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. I recently found a paper that looked at what fraction of um, published papers in economics in different fields were empirical versus theoretical or, or a combination of the two. And development economics was uh, the most empirical uh, field with, within economics, uh, kind of the, the movement that you're a part of had, had really taken off. Interestingly, it had always been a majority, even going back decades. I think people sometimes think that development economics isn't empirical at all. Maybe those, maybe the studies in the past were less likely to be randomized controlled trials, less likely to be the very high standard of uh, of evidence that, that that represents. Uh, but it's now over 90%, in fact, of papers in development economics uh, are about collecting and analyzing data. You're looking a little bit skeptical? I, I'll, I'll, I'll stick up a link to that and I'll send it to you and you can, you can see what you think. The policy area you specialize in the most is energy and environment, right? Correct, yeah. I hadn't really heard of RCTs or trials being kind of conducted in that area so much. What, what are kind of the, the issues that are at play there and, and how do you measure whether policies are working? Yeah, I think it's a common misconception that impact evaluation is is harder or somehow less possible of environment and energy policies. And I think a bunch of our affiliated professors have proven that that's absolutely not the case. So they are examining questions related to energy access. So for instance, uh, piloting solar microgrids in communities that don't have access to electricity in 
and seeing if people are willing to pay for it and whether gaining access to electricity changes their lives in terms of uh, test scores or how they spend their time. Uh, we also look at problems related to pollution reduction, both indoor air pollution, which kills between three and four million people per year, and outdoor air pollution, um, both working with uh, NGOs who are testing solutions to help protect people against pollution, but also major regulators uh, and doing really large scale experiments um, with industrial plants and how to get them to reduce their pollution. Uh, and then third, we look at questions related to climate change. And I think how it relates to poverty is that everyone knows that the poor in developing countries are going to be disproportionately harmed by climate change and a lot earlier than the rest of us. And so um, looking at ways to both mitigate carbon emissions, but also increase people's resilience um, to uh, the changes that are going to come with climate change. So for instance, um, uh, testing uh, drought resistant and flood resistant seed varieties that help smallholder farmers who rely only on rainfall cope with either too much of it or too little of it. Mm. Are there any, you know, RCTs that have been done in that area where you got really positive results and you think like this is a real winner of a policy that, that, that lots of people should be, uh, should be applying? So there are a lot of exciting interventions that have been evaluated once and found to be effective, but you know, it might be useful to replicate them in other contexts or uh, with different implementers or uh, with different designs to see if they're effective in multiple places. Um, one uh, really exciting paper that came out recently was an evaluation of a payments for environmental services program in Uganda that uh, paid landowners to refrain from cutting down trees on their land. Uh, and it was a really cost-effective program that uh, cut the deforestation rate from between 7 and 10% to between 2 and 5%. Um, and that's a model that's actually been tried um, a, by a lot of governments and a lot of NGOs all around the world. And this is, to my knowledge, the first randomized control trial of it. Um, but before going out and recommending it broadly, I'd, I'd love to see more evidence on this topic from others. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if we can find that study and stick up a link to it. It's uh, in that's, Science that's... by Seema Jayachandran, Yost a lot, a couple other. Fantastic. I think you're exactly right that we have to make sure that anything that we're going to scale up hugely has been tested uh, more than once. I, I guess we saw with, with the worm wars that, that uh, you and uh, probably most of our listeners will be familiar with that there was a, you know, a high quality trial done in Kenya, I think in the early 2000s that showed enormous effects from, from deworming children. Um, and since then, there's, there's been other studies and, and it probably still looks like it's a pretty good thing to, to scale up, especially given how extremely uh, cheap it is. So even if there's only, you know, a 50% chance that, that it's, uh, that it's valuable, it could still be, you know, really good, really good bang for buck in, in expected value terms. But there's a bit of a risk if you, you know, have one study and then you scale something up enormously and then it turned that later on there's a there's a second study that, that doesn't replicate the original result that you could you could potentially you know discredit the idea of evidence-based policy uh, as, as, a, as a whole and so it might, might be good before we you know leap in to, to, to double check the working that's an important point and I think replication is obviously very important and, and we do a lot of studies of similar interventions in different contexts but another way to think about that is an idea that um, a couple of our professors, including uh, Paul Niehaus oh, yeah. of Give Directly Fame and Kartik Morelli Daran, uh, have put out a paper recently, I think it's called Experimenting at Scale, where uh, another way you could think about, you know, the results from one study being enough to scale up a policy is if um, we evaluate programs at scale in a uh, in a sample that's representative of the population that it could be scaled up to. Um, and so it's, it's not always the case that you'd need to um, do it a second time. Sometimes it could just be that the original um, the original RCT is done in such a way that it really is representative of what it would look like at scale. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the doing it the second time is not is no longer valuable. It's it's more the latter that if you uh, purposefully do a representative sample of the population that you're thinking about scaling up to, um, the results might be much more likely to generalize. Mm, yeah, I guess that one of the underlying problems is that it's a lot easier to offer a service in a really high quality way when you're only delivering it to a thousand people in a trial than it is when you're delivering it to tens of millions across the, in, the entirety of India or something like that. Yeah, these uh, you know nationally representative samples uh, often associated with more expensive study. Um, how can you tell if this kind of work is a, is a good fit for you? You're not afraid to go and live in a lower middle income country and uh, work for less pay than you would get in the private sector and... Uh, you know, just start doing research in the field, which involves yeah. like long hours, writing complicated surveys and 
complex operations management, uh, learning coding in lots of different languages. If that sounds exciting to you, um, I think you're right for this type of work. And then also uh, working with governments obviously requires like a good deal of optimism, patience, and uh, mm, like communication skills, charisma. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, what's the biggest downside of working in, in policy? So personally, I really miss working in direct services. Like I would love to just be handing out cash to really, really poor people. <laughs> to be able to see the, the benefits that's being provided directly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, it's, it's a bit remote from the actual impact that you're having. You have to have some faith that uh, someone's being helped, but you don't see them directly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Where do you think personally that development economists uh, can, can do the most good? Is, is there any particular um, pressing problem within the field uh, where you think you know, ec- economic skills can, can have a really big impact? So I've been encouraged by a lot of the aff- affiliated professors in the j network who are committed not only to answering questions that are relevant for economics as a discipline, but also important to governments making real decisions. If you want to read a good primer on that topic, um, Esther's, Esther Duflo's recent paper called The Economist as Plumber gets into these questions about how economists can help uh, policymakers uh, design programs and policies more effectively. Okay, well, we'll stick up a, up a link to that. I'd be interested to read it. Yeah. Well, what's, what's so good about plumbers? So uh, the analogy of plumbers, they're always tinkering with piping and trying to figure out where the bottleneck are and how it, the system as a whole could work better. And I guess the idea is that economists similarly have really good insights about how to relieve bottlenecks in large systems and uh, complex policies and programs that governments implement. And this is an area where economists could add a lot of value and should engage in more, figuring out the nitty gritty details of important big government programs, um, because those details actually matter a lot more uh, than you know many economists might assume. What is it that drew you to work on global poverty? Did, did you consider working on, on other problems in the world instead of, instead of poverty? Not really. I studied abroad in Uganda when I was 19, and I saw how poverty completely limits people in terms of freedom and opportunity. And the relatively small and cheap things that were missing in their lives that were present in my life that could help make their lives a lot better, in turn, including access to just primary preventative health care or primary acute care. There are definitely some people who have, you know, a romantic vision of poverty that people can be, you know, poor but but still happy, and you know, money's money's not everything. Do you think there's some truth to that, or are they basically just uh, have they just not been to countries where people are extremely poor? I would never romanticize the suffering that comes with not having more than a dollar or two or three to live on yeah. a day. That being said, the type of stereotype about the poor that I try to fight against as much as possible is that they don't have the same. Cap- abilities or they're bad at making decisions. I think actually randomized control trials um, have have proven that they make very complex decisions uh, related to savings or financial management, and they might even be better placed to make those choices than the rich because they actually have to are forced to make tough choices. So uh, that's the stereotype about the poor that I think is is most dangerous. But but their lives on a day-to-day basis uh, have quite a lot of unpleasantness in them, and that's what motivates you to, to try to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on now to trying to think about a concrete advice that we might be able to, to learn from your career or concrete opportunities that, that people listening might be able to take if they're, you know, choosing what major to study or what, what to do at, at the postgraduate level or what jobs they might get, uh, you know, having, having done a master's degree. Uh, where do you think young people should start if they want to make, uh, if they want to work on global poverty in a similar way to you? Uh, what, what kind of majors would you recommend that they do? Economics, political science, international development. Snappy answer. And are, are there other options? or paths in global poverty that you think are promising beyond the beyond the traditional ones like possibly you know doing doing entrepreneurship starting a business in the developing world or you know just going and trying trying to work there in in government uh, just directly Definitely. Um, you don't have to go the research route. You don't have to go the international aid, aid route. I think, and I'm very pro entrepreneurship. I think sometimes there's a risk of, you know, I have the one silver bullet solution that's going to yeah. solve anything and it doesn't exist. And therefore I should create an organization around it. I, I would caution a little bit against that. There's probably already someone uh, who's working on the problem and it might be more effective if you wanted to go uh, work for their organization. Mm. 
You go and live in Indonesia、uh, for a couple of months every year. Is that right? That's correct. <laughs> what's What's the reason for that? So we have、uh, JPAL Southeast Asia is our regional office in the region, and it's based at the University of Indonesia in Jakarta. And so I go there、uh, about two months from every year,、uh, working on policy outreach, trying to get the research that's been done by the office、uh, taken up、uh, by government.、Uh, Also helping build and grow the office. We started in 2013 with two people, and now it's an office of 22 people. And uh, also uh, starting work on a couple of research projects there as well.、Mm. Do you think it's important to live in developing countries where you might be helping with, you know,、uh, policy change? And and is this something that people should consider doing in, in possibly their late teens or early twenties when they have the opportunity to? Definitely. And I regret not doing it more. I think、mm. if you want to work in international development, having at least two years of experience living in a development Country is a huge plus and, and can open a lot of doors. What is it specifically that, that you gain from doing that? It's so many different things you gain.、Uh, it's a deeper understanding of human difference, of、uh, cultural and ethnic diversity, of being able to live with less creature comforts than you're used to,、uh, being able to understand how to get things done in resource poor environments,、uh, being able to put your personal comfort. Behind a greater cause and mission,、uh, and then it, it also gains you a lot of credibility with a lot of major players in working in development to see that that you've、um, lived and worked and thrived in、uh, lower middle income countries. So let's say that you're doing or or you have completed a relevant undergraduate degree. How can you go about kind of building a professional network in in global poverty reduction, and how can you kind of experiment with different options that you might have in that in that whole field、uh, when you're in your mid twenties? So it, it's not. Not the prettiest answer. A lot of people right out of undergraduate first take an internship that's often unpaid and often in a developing country, and then they convert it later into a paid position.、Um, that's what I did. That worries me because I think internships should be paid, but it is what a lot of people do. I think. What really helped me build my professional network in international development,、uh, because I wasn't lucky enough to get into an important institution right out of undergrad. I was working for very small niche NGOs. Was going back to get my master's, and that completely. You know, exponentially grew my professional network and gave me connections to all the major organizations that I would hope to work for.、Mm. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the masters in just a minute, but are, are there any conferences that you went to to kind of meet people bef- before you'd done that, or what? What are the big events that you go to now where people who wanted to meet you might be able to, you know, find you in the corridor? So I'm in economics, and so you usually find me at the、um, AEA conference every year, but also the other. AEA, the American Evaluation Association, we're usually at that as well. Those are the those are the two that you that you go to mostly. Yeah, but those are not for development more broadly. Those the first is for economists, and the second is for evaluators,、mm. um, which includes economists, but also includes a lot of、uh, qualitative、yeah. researchers and、um, anthropologists, sociologists, etc. Well, I guess if you had a, a conference that was just focused on poverty reduction as a whole, you could end up with a million people there. It's 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 quite a large sector, right? Yeah, and what happens is that there there are just a million conferences yeah, a year. <laughs> right, right. So it sounds like perhaps the most important thing that we can learn from your career is the value of doing one of these excellent master's programs. So obviously, I've I've said. What what you studied, but are, are there any other programs that that people could try to get into that could really help to advance their career? Yeah, if you're interested in public policy and international development, particularly, there is a group of schools called the APSIA schools. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a group of about 25 master's programs at universities around the U.S. and I think maybe a couple in Canada that have high quality、uh, master's degrees in these fields. They include、uh, Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, Harvard's Kennedy School,、uh, Johns Hopkins、uh, School for Advanced International Studies, George Washington, Georgetown. American、uh, Denver University,、uh, a lot of universities in California, and so it's it's a lot of great public policy schools out there. That's a really useful list. How do you think doing a master's compares to doing a PhD? Have, have you considered doing a PhD yourself? Definitely considered doing a PhD myself. So, so doing a PhD in order to make policy change is not one of the top things that. Most people going into a PhD are trying to do, and I'm really proud of the ones who are. And I would encourage you know more and more to think about it. But、um, it, going into a PhD is really great for becoming an academic or、uh, a full time researcher. But I knew I wanted to work in、uh, policy action rather than、uh, full time research. That makes sense. I guess most of the people, you know, the principal investigators will have PhDs at JPAL, right? So if you want to go into kind of hard, hardcore social science research, then a PhD is kind of necessary. That's correct. Yeah, if you want to be a principal investigator on an impact evaluation that you hope might someday be published in an academic journal, you need a PhD. Yeah. 
it would be useful to, to, to list some of the organizations that people might actually be able to apply to work for uh, other than, than J-PAL and Seeker that, that we've talked about. First, uh, you know, people can like, global poverty is a problem that quite a lot of people want to work on, and, and it can be quite competitive, as you said uh, early on in your career. What kinds of places can people apply to when they're f- uh, fairly uh, at the earlier stages of their career, uh, where they might actually have a decent shot at getting either a job or at least an internship that will let them get their foot in the door? So, if you want to work in impact evaluation, there are lots of other organizations besides um, JPAL and SIGA. There's Innovations for Poverty Action. Uh, Evidence for Policy Design at Harvard. Um, there are a couple private firms who do very similar work, like Ideas42 and ID Insight, um, that I think there are areas where jobs have been growing over the past five years, and I, I don't see that growth slowing down yet. So I think there's a reasonable chance of, of um, getting positions, and there certainly are a lot of openings. What about later on in your career, once you've built up some experience? So what kinds of places can you go to where you might be able to do uh, more good, having you know, really, really advanced your skills? We see a lot of people moving from positions at J-PAL into foundations where they can actually influence how, uh, you know, endowment resources are allocated, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, Some people... Uh, go on to be researchers who are focused on uh, policy relevant research. And I'm most excited about the potential to, to move into government research positions where you can both do research and then actually make a funding decision based on it. Are those governments in the developed world or the developing world or both? They exist in both. I obviously will probably only be qualified to do them in the States. But for instance, the Office of Evaluation Services in the General Services Administration, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the DC Lab, there are all these city and state governments who have their own research wings that are uh, just for the purpose of doing research to figure out how to better run programs for citizens. Um, and I think that's a place where I hope to have policy impact in the future. Interesting. Here's one a little bit uh, out of left field. Uh, most of our readers are you know, people with you know, at least an undergraduate degree in the US or, or the UK. But we do have a decent number of readers in you know, Africa. And, and actually, uh, maybe like 5% of our web traffic is from people uh, living in, in India, uh, people who you know, brought up in India. Do you have any ideas for what, what can you do if you were born in, in the developing world? Uh, how can you most effectively try to reform policy in, in your countries or, or do other things to help people in poverty? So many things. And for one, all of our regional offices are fully staffed by people from the countries where they're based. So um, most of our South Asia office, office, which is based in Delhi, and the, another office in Chennai is fully staffed by people from India. So there's tons of job opportunities there. Um, if people are interested, they should check out our website. And I mean, part of the whole idea behind GPI is try to help government institutions in developing countries grow and become stronger. And one of the best ways to do that is if really smart people from these countries go into government and try to make institutions better from within. So I would encourage people to think about government as an option for them, uh, especially in middle income countries that spend huge amounts of money on uh, primary health care or cash transfers for the poor, um, like India or Indonesia, et cetera. Additionally, if government is not the right route for you, I think ultimately the citizens of low and middle income countries will be in a position to hold their governments accountable. So any sort of activism related to uh, requiring the government to um, provide better services. I mean, like one organization that does a really good job of that is called Tvaweza that's based in East Africa. That's all about helping citizens hold their governments more accountable to deliver better services. So that's an option if you don't want to go into government yourself. Hmm. I guess there's a, there's a bunch of roles like that where actually, you know, being being a local person who was brought up in that country you know, puts you in a better position than, than a foreigner who's coming in and perhaps doesn't understand the culture or how to get things done as well and you might not have as much traction if they're trying to run a campaign because they're, they're seen as an outsider. Completely. I mean, we're t- the whole thing about GPI is we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. Like developing country governments can do all the same things that you know rich country governments can do and, and soon this will all be re- irrelevant, I hope. Yeah. A question I regularly uh, ask people I'm interviewing is uh, whether you think you would uh, do more good if uh, instead of trying to uh, you know do, do good through policy reform, instead you've gone out and tried to make a lot of money and then do donated your earnings to help tackle poverty, uh, you know, e- either doing cash transfers perhaps or providing medical services or perhaps funding a think tank or an organization like J-PAL. Is that something that you ever that you ever have ever thought about or have a view on? I've definitely thought about it. And in, in some ways, I think it's quite likely that I could have more impact just giving all my money away to cash transfers for the poor. And sometimes I wish I was just doing a daydream about that. Uh-huh. But I have a broader goal in mind, which is 
helping improve institutions and having an optimism despite corruption, despite the hurdles of bureaucratic processes that uh, governments in developing countries have the capacity and the capability to run high quality programs that reduce poverty. Um, and that in some small way by, you know, uh, helping them test their latest innovations before scaling them up or scaling up things that RCTs have shown to be effective in the past, that I'm also contributing in some very, very small way to those institutions being more effective to deliver quality services to their citizens. Yeah. It sounds like j has quite a lot of traction with developing world governments and their budgets are often very large. So it would, it would kind of surprise me if you could have more impact by just, uh, by just donating the money maybe you have potential to earn more money than the one i appreciate but uh i expect that the uh that the changes in budgets you're getting through jpal are probably doing doing more good than that i would just have to get out my spreadsheet <laughs> so do you feel like your career track has been uh risky at all um i mean initially you're working at, at non-profits in the developing world w- w- did you ever feel like you weren't sure what your what your next position was going to be or whether you'd be able to you know transition into into other problems if you decided that you didn't want to work on global poverty anymore? So I will say that early on in my career, I was very worried that by working for small NGOs that I couldn't transition into working for big NGOs, foundations, or policy organizations, or research organizations. And I was quite pleased that that wasn't the case at all. And um, obviously, the master's program helped with that a lot. But it, it was um, possible to go from a smaller NGO to a bigger organization like j I do think that it is harder for people who go into public policy to then go into the private sector. And that's something a lot of my um, peers um, think about and struggle with a lot. There is definitely organizations value skills um, from the private sector and from the business world. And I I feel like it's usually easier for people to switch from the private sector to the policy space or the public sector rather than the other way around. Yeah. So perhaps early on in your career, if you want to be flexible, you might want to go into the private sector first. I'll just say that it's easier to transition, transition that yeah. way than the other way. Um, I suppose that the but skill- you could just do what I did and not go into the private <laughs> sector at all, and, and you can still be quite successful. Yeah. Well, it seems like you, your career has uh, jumped forward in leaps and bounds over the last five years, so I really look forward to seeing uh, where you end up in, in the next five years. Maybe you'll be, I don't know, running the finance ministry in India. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not India. <laughs> You're not, not a fan of, of living in India? No, it's just that Indians can run their own finance <laughs> ministries. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's a, that, that's a pretty fair point. Maybe, maybe you'll be running J-PAL instead. <laughs> no. <laughs> my, my guest today has been uh, Claire Walsh. Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Claire. Thanks so much, Rob. It's been a pleasure. After recording that show, Claire realized that she spent a lot of time talking about full-time masters, which are not an option for everyone. She wanted me to point out that there's a new low-cost option for anyone who's interested in studying development economics and impact evaluation. The j and MIT Economics Department's new MicroMasters and Blended Masters program in Data, Economics, and Public Policy. It's designed to give people anywhere in the world a high-quality, low-cost, flexible online master's program, even for people who can't go to school full-time. In the program, students take five online courses, and if they pass a proctored exam for each, they earn a MicroMasters from MITx and are eligible to apply for an accelerated master's on campus at MIT. I'll put up a link to that program on the blog post. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.